Hello everyone, welcome back. So, last time we were talking about vorticity, okay, and that was that weird squiggly guy. As a note, it's supposed to be a zeta. It looks a little bit different in your textbook, but I'm doing my best here. And what do we find out? Well, my vorticity is equal to the gradient cross with the velocity. Um, the big thing there is if we have vorticity, so if vorticity is not equal to zero, then we have a rotational flow. If it is equal to zero, we have a irrotational flow. So one case, rotational, other case, irrotational. Why do we care about that? Well, we developed something called the velocity potential, and that works right here. So velocity potential is good if we have an irrotational flow, okay? So we want that sometimes. Now, where our flow is actually irrotational, well, we're going to learn about that more today. We're really going to focus in on that. So let's get right into it. Now, we have had two big assumptions so far. So two big simplifications so far. The first was that things were inviscid, OK? That meant that we were saying that viscosity is not actually equal to zero. We're going to pretend like it's equal to zero. The second one is that we are incompressible. Now we're saying that our density is more or less equal to a constant. By having both of those, it really, really, really helps us out. Okay? So if you have incompressible, inviscid and incompressible flows, well, there's some equations that can really help us to solve things very easily. Um, and those equations are Bernoulli's. and Laplace. Now Bernoulli's I've already mentioned once before, but we're going to go into more detail on it this time. It's just that the pressure plus one half times our velocity squared, just use u there, velocity, is equal to a constant. And Laplace is something we haven't talked about yet, but what we're going to learn is that um, taking the gradient of our gradient for the stream function or of our, oh, sorry, velocity potential or our stream function, is going to be equal to zero. And why do we care about that? Well, because this is a very simple way of modeling flows if it's valid, if it's valid. Okay, now let's keep on going through this. We have these inviscid and we have these incompressible flows, and people might be asking themselves, well, are they the same thing? Does inviscid equal incompressible? If I have one, do I have the other? Well, let's find those out. Because if the answer is yes, that's awesome. But sadly, the answer is not exactly, OK? Though we're often going to see them very, very connected. OK, now last time we were talking about having these little boxes, and I showed you little boxes. And we're just saying, how do we make these boxes rotate? OK, so it goes from one, do my best to make it the same size and shape, to another. So how do we do that? Now, if we want to make a fluid element rotate, we're going to need something to do that. And what do you need? You need shear stress. Okay, so shear stress might look something like this. So I have my little box here. I'm going to, I'll use blue for forces. And I have forces that are going to cause it to rotate. Now, where do these shear stresses come from? Well, I can already give you like an answer we've seen way before this point. But you remember, shear stress is equal to the viscosity times du dy. Oh, this guy. Remember that? Shear stress. We've seen this before. That was way, way earlier. But let's go into more detail. So let's go back to our conservation of mass equation. Sorry, conservation of momentum equation. Conservation of mass is not going enough. OK.
Now, earlier on when we were learning about this, we simplified it quite a bit. This time I'm not going to simplify it as much because I'm going to need to see more terms so we can actually figure out exactly what's happening here. So it looks something like this. We have rho, we have our du dt, the total derivative, is equal to my pressure gradient plus viscosity, I'm going to put that in a different color right here, times d squared u dx squared plus d squared u dy squared plus d squared u dz squared. Writing it out. And then finally our body force. Glorious. So if I'm looking at it, this term roughly right here, that one, that is more or less normal stress. You might be wondering, well, why? Well, if we look at this, I have a little box right here. If it has a pressure gradient, so that means there's more little, you know, collisions on one side than the other, that's going to cause it to stretch. It's going to be compressed on that side. There's more force on this side than this side. Okay? And so if there's a pressure gradient, it's going to cause it to compress or stretch based on that. The second thing is, if I have my velocity and it's changing with my x direction, so my x component velocity is changing with my x position, then I'm going to see something like this. This point right here in the, um, of the fluid element and this point right here are going to get further and further apart as the velocity accelerates, or sorry, as the velocity changes with position. I want to say acceleration, but it's you know, not with time. And that's simply because my velocity here and my velocity here are different. Let's see, let's say this zero and this one is equal to one. Okay, I'm just arbitrary numbers there, arbitrary. And so in both cases, it's gonna cause this guy to stretch or compress, and so that's the normal stress component. Okay, the other component, whoa, wrong button, there we go. Other component is gonna be right here. So this guy plus my shear stress, sorry, plus my viscosity, is equal to shear stress. The reason it's called it's shear stress is because it's how my x component of velocity is changing in a direction that is not the x direction. So it's y or z here. And so those are going to be causing a shear stress. Obviously, it's only like earlier where I have my you know, little fluid element and I begin to, because of that velocity gradient, have it begin to shear, or as in the top is moving faster than the bottom. And if the top is moving faster than the bottom, it's going to look like this. And this is a two-dimensional element I'm drawing, but the same could happen in a third dimension too. By the way, we just have one part of it that's moving faster than the other part, um, and it's not in the same direction. So in this case, we still have two parts that are moving faster, right there and right there, but they're both you know, in the x direction, so it's a normal stress. In this case, it's changing shape, it's deforming because of that. Okay, a little details here that really don't matter for us too much because we usually neglect them. This guy right here, that's the body force. That's simply saying that I have a fluid element and it is being accelerated, but it's being accelerated by a body force. And so therefore it's not changing shape. It's just moving. All of it is moving at the same time. So that's the body force right there. Okay. So if flow is inviscid. Well, then we say that mu is equal to zero. And if that's the case, shear stress disappears. Because we lose that entire second section. So nothing can cause um, rotation. I can rewrite that equation from earlier, but now as inviscid. So I'll go ahead and write that. So rho du dt is equal to negative dp dx plus density times body force. So this is just normal stress. 
we got the body force. And you can see there that we have nothing to cause rotation. There's no shear stress anymore. Shear stress is gone. And you're like, okay. So if you're looking at this, you might eventually think that, well, inviscid therefore does equal irrotational. And while that is true that there's nothing that's causing rotation, it's not technically the case. Because if I have a flow, so here's my fluid flow right here. Just you know, let's make a channel. Here's my channel. Walls. And we're assuming that this is inviscid, so I'm just going to put that in there. U is equal to zero in here. And so I have my fluid flow going through. Beautiful. Nice streamlined, looking great. But what could have happened is, yes, in the area where I'm looking, it could be completely inviscid. And therefore, it's irrotational right there. However, in some region over here, I might have planes where it's not inviscid. Or it had rotation for some other reason. And I might have a fluid element that's moving towards it that is already rotating when it comes into the flow. And if that fluid element is already rotating, then just because I'm now in a inviscid region, it's not going to suddenly stop rotating. It will just continue to rotate because if you're inviscid, there's nothing to stop it from rotating either. So it was already rotating before it came in, and so it continues. So rotation can be brought in Vorticity can be brought in to an irrotational inviscid area. Okay, so the answer we get at the end is that inviscid especially if I can spell it <laughs> Inviscid is technically not equal to irrotational. Okay. Technically. But as you can see, if I am inviscid, there's nothing to cause rotation inside of the area that I'm looking, inside of the area that I'm caring about. And so a lot of times you will see the two together. So just because they're not the same, just because they're not actually twins, doesn't mean they're not related, okay? Now, before I close out this video, let's figure out when I should assume inviscid or incompressible, because both of those are important. There are assumptions we've used a ton, and you're gonna need both of those as we go forward, because assumptions are how we solve aerodynamics. Okay, so when to assume. So remember, you're engineers now, so you always get an answer. They always, somebody says, you know what they say about people who assume? You can say, yes, they're engineers. Okay. So first off, I'll make it inviscid right here. I spelled it right this time. Nice. And we're going to have about three cases. So one, you're away from walls. Walls have velocity gradients because of boundary layer. Okay, you gotta be outside the boundary layer. VL boundary layer. And if you're looking at that from a close view, it would look something like this. You would see a velocity gradient right next to the wall because the velocity at the wall has to be equal to zero and it goes up to the free stream at some distance away from it. And that height right there is the boundary layer height. Okay, two, if you've got a high Reynolds number, because remember, Reynolds number is equal to the ratio of your inertia to your viscous forces. And so if you have a high, so if inertia is high and viscous forces are low, then you're more or less inviscid. 
because the viscous effects are therefore negligible because inertia is dominating. Okay, and finally, the last one we're going to do this is going to be for low velocity gradients. Okay, just very, very small velocity gradients. They're there, they still exist, but because they're changing so slowly, we can more or less say, eh, it's close enough, the amount of rotation it's causing is negligible. Okay, last one, what about incompressible? We didn't talk about it too much in this video, but still, we've seen it a lot. So for incompressible, I'm gonna put a line right here. There you go. Number one is gonna be for low speeds, which we talked about, mox below 0.3, because above that point, you really start getting into compressibility effects and your answers get worse and worse. And two, just for liquids, okay? If you're a liquid, you're usually incompressible. So water, typically incompressible. If you are compressing water, you are at scary pressures and, well, one, you're dealing with water and that's not aerodynamics. We are aerodynamics, we deal with air, seriously. Go to a hydrodynamics for a class for that. Okay, so that's it for this time. Thank you all so much. And next time we're gonna get into some of the equations that are super helpful and how they're derived and how we use them. Have a great day, bye-bye.